Hello, I'm Hotep and welcome. I'm Mog Morgan and this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. What follows is the first part of a series of lectures on the Egyptian god Seth. Okay, Seth. So, I, in a nutshell, then, this god set, and uh, I'll put a few pictures up there. He's quite strange looking, some of his avatars. Uh, he's got various forms and everything like that. But the, there was, there are two verses from the Book of the Dead, translated at different times, which kind of show you the difficulty of working out what the, the, or people have had about coming to terms with the god set. So the first one says, I am the sun, Seth, who causes the turbulence of the storm circling within the horizon of the sky like the crooked god. So that's one translation from the Book of the Dead. And then the second one, another translation by an equally as eminent uh, uh, scholar of uh, Egyptology, and we use a lot of scholars' work, it, the same thing says, I am the sun, Seth, who clears the tur turbulence of the storm. So whereas the first one says it causes the turbulence, this one, Seth clears the turbulence of the storm, circling within the horizon of the sky like the crooked god. Uh, so in one account, the, exactly the same piece of hieroglyphics is translated, cause the storm, or clear the storm, and that's so set in that ambiguity, this kind of fact that it can be two things at once. And also, I, I think it's one of these things, I, I like to connect all this uh, Egyptian stuff with the uh, stuff that came later, especially in India and the Tantric tradition, where they have a lot of language that has these multiple layers and often contradictory layers of meaning. Uh, they weren't the first to do that sort of stuff. So I just want to point out how one word can completely change your understanding of an ancient god uh, who is sometimes is seen as the personification of bad things and other times as doing a good job or doing their job. And this is probably one of the main interests of set is difficult to pin down in in that way uh, okay so a, a quick bit of blurb on that set as i say is this ancient egyptian deity who is often maligned in uh, popular uh, literature but also academic and theological thought he's kind of put down really or was up until the last 20 years or so as i say up until fairly recently the only thing you needed to know about this god seth that there was that he was supposedly the personification of evil and the prototype for the devil satan and all the bad things in the world uh, now for some people that's makes him attractive you know you know because people are looking to outside the box as it were so the personification of evil it it's interesting it's it's an important thing to to come to grips with i would say he is the god who is one of the more who who in one of the world's um, most common myths kills another god he kills his own brother, Osiris, who is a uh, very, very important and God that we will come get to terms with as well. Uh, Osiris, in fact, is together with Ra, as I mentioned last time. These are the two two most important cults within Egypt, Osiris and Ra. So we're not kind of putting Seth on a on a pinnacle and saying he's the most important god in a way that's another thing he plays a role in the mythology of these other gods and that's that's an interesting side that he has anyway he is everybody knows this myth that's if anything that Seth kills his brother Osiris then he takes over his role as king and he 
persecutes his family, the Osiris' remaining family, primarily the orphan Horus, who only survives in this sort of dynastic Game of Thrones type war due to his the cunning of his mother, the goddess Isis, is another kind of entity that we're going to have to think about. These are all important aspects, really. And she is uh, a practitioner of magic as well. And there's a kind of interesting interplay between all of these characters in terms of magic. There's an interplay between Isis and Set, which will all kind of come out or, or in the course of the year, hopefully. So Horus eventually grows up. She protected and overpowers Set, his uncle, I suppose, and punishes him, or he is punished, and takes his rightful place as his father's successor. There's a heck of a lot of magic encoded in that, which is going to take us at least a year to even start getting into. Anyway, that perception of that that's all set is, is the murder of Osiris, has changed a lot over the last few years. Uh, his star has risen, as they say. He has returned. Since the 1960s, his, his cult has revived. Uh, once upon a time, the knowledge of his mythos was only confined to a small group of Egyptologists and a few scholars of the weird, weirder byways of Egyptian religion. These days, scholarly articles and books about the god, there's loads of them, all steadily changing the way we look upon him. More research is coming out. He's become the focus of several modern reconstituted cults or affinity groups, including the one that I kind of work with, which is the Companions of Set. And all of them, all of us, if you like, are engaged in reviving his worship and renovating the image, or at least letting, giving a more uh, mature view of, of this God rather than this black and white thing of he's evil and blah, blah, blah. He's a much more complicated entity and much, therefore much more important for us to engage in. And even those who are not into... The setting thing, the neo pagans around us, our colleagues, who wouldn't say that they were exactly devotees of this, but they have a sort of respect now for set uh, that they didn't have before. And, use and there's very few books that don't try to at least engage and explain what the role is. It hardly any text, as I say, published today. Uh, will will fail to have a view on this. They always have a view now. And the ethical questions, yeah, ethical questions that comes into magic as well, the eth uh, which are about the nature of evil, and they're relevant to this thing of the human condition, the problems that we encounter today. So magic is relevant, in especially in this, in that it's looking to the to the core issues, to the heart of the matter, which is evil and why people do bad things, or if they do, and what it means to kind of uh, be, a, be a human in such a complicated world. As I say, mo the most notable problem would be this issue of good versus evil, and sooner or later everybody has to kind of develop a view of that. I say the roots of the modern change in religious sen sensibility lie in 1960s, it was a long time ago, I know, more specifically in San Francisco and the Summer of Love, which was the counterculture really, which is, you know, so many things that happened then of we take for granted. Uh, and as I say, the, 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 the new Setian age kind of started then for some people. But it was quite a long way away from Egyptian mythology and culture at first. This is the resurgence was made fertile by the appearance of Satanism, right? Okay, we've got to get there at some point. Satanism, it's a kind of little bit of maybe a scary word and all the rest. 
it was a kind of cult, even though I think they it's countercultural thing there. I I say I, don't, I think Anton Lavey maybe didn't like the idea that they counterculture. They thought they were kind of conserving culture. They were saving American values and all the rest. But whatever this idea of revolution and sort of new culture and new ideas was kind of linked with a sort of cultural satanism at first as a, as a way of kind of shaking people up i suppose you would say i don't think it was particularly a religious thing it was just kind of more the shock value or or the fact that the existing values seem to have been discredited you know the people who were good didn't actually when you dug down didn't seem that good so then you think, well, if that's good, well, maybe the bad people are actually not as bad as people think. So hence you get this countercultural Satanism type movement, and a, and a whole even a church, which is a skit, which is another pokeny whatever in the Church of Satan. You know, it's, it's a bit heretical the idea of a Church of Satan, but out of that organization which you could say is a little bit show business is show business after about 10 years it evolved it moved away from this idea of satan and who lo and behold it was the god set that they thought really that's what this is about there's this ancient deity connected with magic who has this bad reputation that doesn't seem completely logical uh, that they that they should be thought of as bad, and so they that they founded a new organization, uh, which was then called the Temple of Set. Which I'm not, I know people in it, but I've never really felt the need to be part of that particular way of practicing the Setian magic. I do the Companions of Set thing, but there are lots of different approaches to this. But whatever credit where credit is due, they kind of brought it to the fore if you like they they, they founded an organization based around the god set so uh, put it down here wait a minute i can hear you shouting at the screen maybe you're shouting at the screen wait a minute surely there are other maybe if you heard of it, i don't know there are other occultists at the time who who got there first yeah you know the idea that this kind of slightly show business organization could have come across something as interesting and as important as the god set you kind of think well maybe somebody else and uh people think of a particular writer you might check out i'm not suggesting you go and read all of his books but you know it's some sort of thing i can give you an idea of something you could read if if it is this person called kenneth grant and he as dead he's dead now but he was he's i suppose you'd say he's the most respected interpreter of alistair crowley he was kind of putting his papers in order his literary executor and he he kind of became an expert on crowley and developed a quite an interesting interpretation of it this is alistair crowley who is got something of the setian in him he was he's routinely in the press he's called a satanist rather inaccurately it has to be said although he did style himself as the b666 from the new testament book of revelations i mean all these things i don't know they, they they're probably quite scary things when you first think about this it's really testing your your testing you out this stuff whether whether you're how much of this sort of propaganda if you if you absorbed that so much that even just mentioning some of these words seems like the devil's going to jump in through the window and t drag you to hell or whatever which you know we've, we've all been there uh so uh, Kenneth Grant was for many years the head of a magical order which was related to Crowley's um, Ordo Templi Orientis, or Order of the Oriental Temple. And it, it, I don't think they use that name anymore, right, for all sorts of legal reasons. This is the time we live in and everything. Uh, and it's changed its name now 
probably a better name in some ways to the Typhonian order. And Typhon is just another name for Set, which we'll uh, uh, explain. So they, they actually founded an entire order based on or putting Crowley back to its Egyptian roots, bringing out the Egyptian elements much more and giving it this hidden uh, interpretation or revealing this hidden interpretation as really being connected with the Typhon, with Set. And that's been hugely influential on modern magic, witchcraft and paganism, I would say. He's famous for his this Typhonian interpretation of Crowley's system, which is otherwise Thalema, which is, I suppose, the way, the path of doing one's will. That's another kind of Setian thing. It's about doing your own thing, um, of questioning things and all the rest, which is another reason people find it quite attractive. So Crowley was into this Thalema thing, and Alistair Crowley, his kind of student, perhaps successor kind of gave it another twist and, and made it Typhonian. It's connected with the Setian mythos. Was, with mythos was quite an interesting interpretation. Uh, if you look at ancient texts, you, you say this, this is the outer name. The, the word Typhon itself is a Greek term uh, for a kind of again another quite chaotic scary entity the typhon from which you get the term typhoon i think but in egyptian texts even though they know the word typhon they 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 don't count it as one of these uh, words of power whereas the name seth with uh which i've spelled i'm pronouncing it s-e-t-h which is one way of doing it, it could be set even uh that is actually a power word within the Egyptian tradition. Nobody knows quite what it means, and there's all sorts of speculations. But there's a magical idea for you, that certain words, all words are magically powerful from the Egyptian point of view, but some words are very specifically are words of power, like mantras, names of gods and goddesses, or not all of their names, but certain, certain of their names are kind of have this talismanic quality and Seth's name is like that. Seth's name is a name of power uh, according to the text themselves. Many of the spells in the, a, thing, a collection called the Magical Papyri which uh, I hope I've explained before but uh, do feed back if, if if this is if that's unclear to you what, what I'm referring to. Sometimes called the PGM or the uh, what was that? So, papyri magicae graeci, I think, as a Greek magical papyri, although we, which can put you off the scent really because they're they're, they're not just Greek; they're in the Egyptian tongue. And they're essentially a, an Egyptian magical collection of, of texts, which is incredibly important. In that text, some of which we're going to be studying and working with, uh, they do call upon the power of Seth himself, or Seth himself. And it's usually said, that, I should mention this collection, that it's got various other names. Some people don't like, I think, you know, if you put Greek in front of things, and people like Greek magic, I know, uh, it puts people off the trail, really, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated thing. They call it the Theban magical papyri, or Thebes and Thebes. That's another Greek term, and you might think Thebes is in the Greek islands or mainland somewhere, but there's a Thebes in Upper Egypt, which is uh, nowadays known as Luxor, Waset in the uh, ancient world, but it got called Thebes. So the Theban magical library, it means the Upper Egyptian magical library, uh, and it used all sorts of specialist codes and conventions to indicate which were the more important things that you needed to know. Uh, and in the script, they kind of indicate that in code that this is 
this is the word really and the other thing you could know anyway going back to Kenneth Grant he published a whole series of books and monographs on these sort of topics loads of words which are known as the Typhonian trilogies there's, there's three trilogies uh, of, of the Typhonians and uh, in three lots the first of these I think if you, you get a chance I, I, I'm not recommending go and spend a fortune on uh, first editions and special editions and all the rest you just want to have a look at it really that is called the magical revival published in 1972 when there was a kind of a magical revival another one taking place which we're kind of still part of that i think even whatever it is 50 years later and in that kenneth grant equates an entity called iwas which, who is very important to crowley a kind of discarnate entity, entity who's supposed to have appeared and dictated a whole magical book to Crowley in, in the course of one of his rituals, which is something to be aiming for, isn't it? You know, to have a whole magical book, a libra, uh, dictated to you. That that That's uh, an ambition for a lot of people, even to, to write a thing called a libra. Libra just means book, but in the magical community, libra means something a little bit special about it you know it, it's been channeled in some ways so this whole book came through to Crowley called Liber Al and uh, you know you probably kind of avoided that and Kenneth Grant thought that the entity in that was actually behind the scenes was really hidden was actually set um, but Crowley didn't recognize it uh, it at the time <coughs> Crowley wrote uh, <coughs> that it was all kind of some sort of variation on a theme of Satan and all the rest anyway so Kenneth Grant is an early and important popularizer of what we might call a Setian mythos so making that interpretation of Crowley and then put it in his own books he kind of started a, a tradition he's but he can't claim that he was the only one because as i say there was this thing happening in america and both particular three streams claim that they were the the main men really <coughs> i see i've written here that commenting on the ancient egyptian stelae so crowley as if you read the story it's a very very interesting uh story then he he wanted this particular artifact which is now sitting in the museum in cairo as the kind of i don't know focus of his entire religion really but it's it's still there uh he called this the steli of revealing i revealed the secrets of this new magical current uh Although actually, that it belongs to a Theban priest, Thebes again in Upper Egypt, and it's uh, it's it's devoted to Konsu. Anyway, but whatever way you look at it, this steli is a talisman of great power within the Crowleyan system. People often make a version of this themselves uh, if they're particularly into Crowley. They they get a version of it some, one way or another, and it shows the goddess uh, star goddess Newt arched over a solar phallic fire of spirit and the letter abraxas or abrahadabra kind of written within it and some people have argued from all of that that the letter of spirit or, or, or yeah of fire shin is the f first letter of set's name as well and all these sorts of things give a clue this is a sort of type of reasoning that magicians go in for really maybe it seems a bit convoluted and you have to be careful not to get carried away with with this but it it seemed to fit together that uh that set was actually the real power behind all this even if crowley had missed it okay so that's a little bit of stuff uh information on set we'll, we'll gradually we percolate through you get the idea it's quite an interesting God, we've got the literal name of, of this month, which is the, as I said, is tech or means the cup. Thanks for listening. 
Next up is part two, the Egyptian gods set the pre-dynastic uh, period, i.e. the origins of the mythology and how these still affect us even today. <laughs> 